Hello, and welcome to this SRC Learning Essentials series video about MPLS Fast Reroute. If you are not familiar with the Service Routing Certification Program, you can learn more by visiting our website at www.networks.nokia.com src. In the following presentation, we will discuss two different ways to recover when the connectivity provided by an MPLS tunnel is interrupted, secondary paths and fast reroute. We will also explain why fast reroute provides a quicker recovery method. This is performed using either one-to-one -one or facility, and we will discuss the differences between the two. Finally, we will head to our lab environment to configure and verify MPLS fast reroute operation. All right, so suppose we have an MPLS tunnel between routers 1 and 8, and the blue arrow represents its primary path. If anything fails, a link for instance, then the router that detects the failure needs to send a path error message back to the head end router. The head end router in turn can switch the traffic over onto a secondary path if one exists. Note that the delay between the detection of the failure by router 6 and the activation of the secondary path by router 1 may cause for a number of packets to be dropped at the point of failure. A better solution would be for the router that detects the failure to locally solve the problem by using an alternative path to forward packets all the way to the tail end, that is, to use a detour that avoids the point of failure. And that is the goal of fast reroute. It is a faster solution because there is no need to wait for the head end to be informed in order to solve the problem. Instead, the router that detects the failure becomes a point of local repair or PLR. The head end is still informed of the failure, but in the meantime, the traffic flow is not interrupted. In this example, router 6 has found a detour that is to be used if the link that connects it to the next router in the primary path fails. It is also possible to protect against the potential failure of an entire router, as is the case on router 4, that can find a way to forward packets to the tail end even if the next router in the path, router 6 in this case, were to fail. The same would also apply to router 2. Now, since the head end has been informed of the failure, it can still at that point activate a secondary path and switch the traffic over onto it. The advantage of using fast reroute is that the traffic flow is not interrupted during the entire time between the detection of the failure and the activation of the secondary path. One thing to note, the detour used by fast reroute may not always be optimal. For instance, the MPLS tunnel may have reserved bandwidth on the primary path that might not be available on the detour. The advantage of using a secondary path in addition to fast reroute is that its parameters can be chosen according to the application requirements. For instance, the same amount of bandwidth can be reserved on the secondary path as on the primary path. Also keep in mind that if we didn't have any of those two methods, fast reroute or a secondary path, the primary path is still resignaled after an amount of time called the retry timer, which by default is 30 seconds. So traffic will be lost during that entire time. Let's explain secondary paths and fast reroute using the example of a rented luxury car. Suppose that you are driving along the highway and suddenly get a flat tire. At that point, you have two options. You can use the spare tire, which is a quick solution that would allow you to continue to drive to get to a safer place. However, by using the small spare tire, the car does not look as luxurious as before. That is what fast reroute represents. The other option would be to call the car rental office and ask for another car, which will come as nice and shiny as the original one. The drawback in that case is that you need to wait far longer to have your problem solved. That is what a secondary path represents. And again, nothing keeps you from using both solutions. 
you can use the spare tire to get to your destination and once there call the rental agency and ask them to send you a new car. Fast reroute comes in two types, one-to-one -one and facility. In one-to-one -one fast reroute, the point of local repair will calculate a detour that avoids the potential failure and then takes the shortest path to the tail end. In this method, MPLS tunnels do not share detours, which means that a new detour needs to be signaled by a router for each LSP it needs to protect. In facility fast reroute, the point of local repair will calculate a detour that avoids the potential failure and then goes back to the original path as soon as possible. Bypass tunnels can be shared in this case, which means that if a bypass tunnel already exists that avoids a potential failure, it will be used by other LSPs that need the same protection. Now, let's go to our lab environment and configure an LSP with fast reroute and verify its correct operation. Okay, so here we are in our lab environment. To look at the configuration of the LSP on R1, we can do a configure router MPLS, enter, followed by the info command. And here we can see the LSP is named 2 underscore R4. And it is a very simple LSP with a tail end of 10, 10, 10, 4 and a primary path called fully underscore loose. Note that, as the name implies, it is fully loose because there are no explicit hops specified. Next, let's take a look at the status of the LSP by running show router MPLS LSP, the name of the LSP, which is 2 underscore R4 path detail. And from the output, we can see that the administrative state and operational state is up and moving down below we can see that the primary path currently has actual hops of R1 to R2 to R3 and finally the tail end R4. So back to the configuration with the info command where we can confirm that the LSP is currently not configured for fast reroute. Now, before we enable fast reroute, we must enable CSPF. So, LSP 2 underscore R4 CSPF. CSPF is needed because the path is fully loose. And this is the algorithm that is needed to calculate which routers will be included in the path. Next, we can enable fast reroute using the fast reroute command. Note that we didn't specify which type of fast reroute to enable. However, if I go back and then run the info command again, we can see that by default one to one has been selected. So only if you require facility do you need to specify the type when configuring fast reroute. Okay, so let's look at the status of the LSP again using the show router MPLS LSP 2 underscore R4 path detail command. And notice the output of the actual hops has changed. Routers 1, 2, and 3 have the at symbol meaning that all of them have been able to calculate a fast reroute detour. Routers 1 and 2 also have the end flag, meaning they have calculated node protection. Now, before we cause a failure along the path, I'm going to change the retry timer of the LSP to 300 seconds. Otherwise, by the time the flags arrive back to the head end, the LSP may retry signaling the primary path and therefore we may not be able to see the detour being used. So this will give us more time to see exactly what happens. So retry timer 
300. To cause a failure, I'm going to go to R2 and shut down port 113, which goes to router R3. So I'm breaking this link between R2 and R3, which will cause R2 to become the point of local repair. Back to R1 to look at the LSP again. And this time we can see a new flag. Router R2 now has the pound flag, meaning that the detour is in use. So R2 became the point of local repair and sent a ResV message back to the head end, R1 in this case, who can now identify that the detour is active. We can also see the new hops that the path is taking, which after R2 goes to R6, R7, R8, and finally R4. So that's it for this demonstration on how to configure and verify MPLS Fast Reroute. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Content for this video was adapted from the Nokia Multi Protocol Label Switching Course. You can access the complete course via any of the three learning formats shown on this page, as well as get remote private access to a service router lab to complete the course lab exercises. If you are interested in obtaining an SRC certification, this table identifies the recommended courses and required exams for each of the five available certifications in the program.